Hi everyone, thanks for joining us. You're here at the um, Welding for Today's Shops uh, webinar. We're going to give it just a few more minutes, let a few more people um, get on. We'll be starting in just a minute. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us today. I am Krista McNamara, Managing Editor of ABR and Magazine. I'm here today with Richard Perry, who's the Global Repair Product Manager at Chief Automotive Technologies. He's going to talk with us today about some common welding techniques for today's vehicles and how the right equipment can really ensure a better weld regardless of the metal that you're working with. He's also going to review some aluminum welding techniques and how they differ from steel, some MIG brazing and its use in high strength steel applications, and more. So a few um, housekeeping items before we get started. The presentation is expected to take about an hour. It will be available in archive. You can go after the presentation is finished to abrn.com slash welding techniques or visit our YouTube page. It'll be available in both places. If you have any questions today during the broadcast, we do have a Twitter feed along the left hand side of your screen. Uh, put uh, hashtag any questions with hashtag ABRN webinars or you can include questions in the comments tool in the bottom of your screen. We'll be taking questions until the end of the day today and then Richard will address all your questions in written form after the fact. We'll be sending out an email blast to all registrants so you'll have a hard copy of all the questions and answers. So Richard, thanks so much for being here with us today and the floor is yours. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, what we'd like to talk about is a MIG welding and this is through Chief University and Electron and one of the things we want to start off with is all the different steel types that are out there today. The OEMs have developed many different uses of the different materials that are out there, which also gives us the need for different joining methods. If you look at it, 80% um, of the new metals have been developed in the last 20 years. If you notice the vehicles that are coming out today, you've seen so many changes in the structures in just the last five years in the methods of repairs. You're seeing more frequently used a mix of high strength materials such as dual phase, uh, cold pressed, uh, high strength low alloy, trip steel, martensetic. Uh, a lot of these have different technical characteristics aimed at different uses throughout the vehicle. Some of these are using methods for joining such as brazing. It may happen that a lot of these different materials, depending on the type and the car manufacturers, are going to be used in different areas uh, of the vehicle for production. And what we need to do is look at how the vehicles are designed and what the proper repair methods are. A lot of these methods are going to be used brazing. You're going to see more and more aluminum usage. Uh, you're still going to have many, many different types of steel that are going to be out there. What are the methods that are going to be used for joining these? And before we get into some of this, we need to look at some of the different methods that a MIG welder is going to use during the process of creating the puddle using the wire. We look at three types of uh, joining with the MIG welder. There's a, what we refer to as a short circuit. That's an arc that's kept deliberately small so that it repeats the droplets very quickly into the pool during the welding form process. So as you're welding it creates a small droplet, it cuts that bridge, that droplet falls into the pool of material and it just keeps repeating this method. Then there's what we refer to as uh, a globular drop. 
what happens with this is when you raise the voltage up 20 to 30 volts depending on the material and the gases that you're using it will create a droplet larger than the wire size for a transfer now what will happen with this is the electromagnetic field forces what we refer to as an uncontrollable uh, disorderly push of that droplet meaning that it's not going to go in a, a predictable pattern that's going to kind of spray all over the place then we also have what we call a spray mode that's when there's electro or electromagnetic force that directs that droplet towards the weld pull in a more systematic approach where everything's going to be in the same pattern over and over this characteristic of what we refer to as synergic pulse a lot of the OEMs today are requiring a pulse inverter welder for the new vehicles that are coming out one of the advantages of this is being able to create this transfer the synergic links up with the weld parameters of each other helping the operator in the regulating regulation of the power source what this means is with the synergic we're setting it up to where both or I shouldn't say both we're setting it up to where the voltage or the amperage is set up with the wires or the material size and the speed of the wire so if one thing is changed all the other things all the parameters are changed accordingly with other settings so this makes it very simple you don't have to go in there and dial in the voltage you don't have to go in there and dial in the wire speed once you set one it sets the parameters for all the rest of the uh, settings the advantages of pulse when you work with the current you're using the lower amperage then the transition value keeping the spray droplets to a very uh, keeping it to a spray drop transfer mode this is more of a controlled spray what this offers is reduced heat input to the works piece which gives you a much better looking weld it will also give you the advantage of welding thinner pieces of metal using this pulse technology so if you're welding wire let's say is a one millimeter you can weld material that is thinner than a one millimeter such as some of the outer panels and we know with some of the manufacturers they're requesting a 1.0 millimeter wire or 1.2 millimeter wire but that wire size will be used for all repairs on that vehicle whether it's a structural repair or at an outer panel crack so with the pulse technology you're able to weld these thinner materials with that technology better penetration without changing the wire diameter size you also get better penetration compared to the short circuit short circuit you have to be closer you get a higher voltage and you get a, a quicker uh, or a hotter weld from that with this you can get better penetration using the pulse you also get reduced splatter that means less cleanup during the uh, material or less cleanup after you've welded the material gives you a much better looking weld something that's more like the dime size or the fish scale weld and of course better control by the operator we also have what we call a double pulse on some machines that are out there the double pulse is obtained by varying the wire speed with respect to the reference speed determined by performing a short weld bead basically it's an on off just very consistent where this becomes relevant is during a vertical weld whether you're welding down or up on a vertical surface or an overhead weld what it's doing is it's it's like a start stop on your welder that's very quick and this will prevent any puddling of the welds uh, whether you're welding vertical or overhead 
Another feature that's active with the Pulse Synergic Welders is the hot starts. This is where you can adjust the wire speed accordingly and it'll create a hotter weld in the beginning. Most of the time you're going to use this if you've got a cold weld or ambient temperature material and you need a hot start to begin with to have a better flow of the material and then you want to transition that down to a lower voltage and a slower weld once the material begins getting warm. So you can set this for whatever length you need at whatever temperature you need and then set the gradual transition or the slow slope down to the regular current needed for that material. At the end of that, on certain materials, especially with aluminum, you're going to have what we refer to as a crater at the end of the weld or a depression in the weld. We also have the feature to do a crater fill. That's where you're going to have a, a period of time where the welder stops, the current drops down, and then comes back on at a lower current, lower speed, and fills for a certain amount of time that weld at the end. That's what we refer to as a crater fill. So you can see that with the diagram, you have the regular current, then there's a slope down with a period where the welder's not running, comes back on, welds at a uh, lower current to fill the puddle. This is what it would look like if you had it set up with a hot start, regular weld, and then a crater fill at the end. And again, this is primarily used with aluminum where you've got a colder temp based material that you're going to start off with. You need a hotter weld. As that material starts to warm up, your welder will drop the current, slow the speed down, and then at the end you'll have a, cr a crater where the welder will stop, pause for a second, and then fill the crater at the end. There's a lot of different functions that are available on today's welders. Another function would be what we refer to as your arc length. You can adjust that depending on the type of welder that you are. Now, the one thing about a MIG welder is you can dial this into programs. You can adjust for hot starts, crater fills, things like this but each technician has their own way of welding. So some technicians may weld very fast. They like to be close to the material. Some technicians weld at a slower pace and they like the wire stake out a little bit further. So you can adjust the arc length depending on the type of welder that you are. couple things that you'll always remember with welding, whether it's uh, aluminum, steel, brazing, that a technician still welds with his eyes and his ears. He has to have hand coordination. It's not like a squeeze type welder where you only have to pull the trigger and you're going to get the same weld over and over. Uh, technicians have to be trained on the equipment. They have to be skilled with the equipment. And they have to listen to know what type of welding is going on. If they're getting too far away from the weld, if they're too close to the weld, they can automatically adjust by the way they speed up, get closer, move back um, accordingly. Programs are set up for the types of weld, whether it's a short weld, a pulse weld, types of material, thickness of material uh, as far as the wire, and then some machines such as ours will have programs already preset into the system to where you go in and if it's aluminum you can look at aluminum is it magne aluminum magnesium or aluminum silicone uh, dial it into whatever the wire size is and hit that program and that program will dial in the features that are the parameters that best fit that type of welding Welding process, whether it's uh, inert gas or MIG welding process, they all have something in common using the electrodes as a filler wire. 
which is continuously fed and heat, heating the job with an arc. You're going to use a shielding gas, and it, it may be a percentage, it may be a pure argon, 2575, there's an 18%, there's a lot of different settings for the uh, shielding gas that you're going to look at. With the welding equipment, a couple things with the welding equipment. You have a machine set up, one, you got to follow manufacturer guidelines. And then all machines should have some type of a duty cycle. It should be posted on the machine. It's uh, it's in minutes out of 10, basically. So like if you're looking at a certain machine, it always operates with the rated amperage. Some machines, such as ours, may say uh, duty cycle for 10 minutes. If it's at 200 amps, you get 60%. That means you can weld for six minutes continuously at 200 amps before the machine needs a break. If we weld at 160 amps, we've got a 100% duty cycle, meaning we can weld all day long and not have to give the machine a break at that amperage. So each machine has got their own setup. Uh, our, it should be posted for the duty cycles. Welding considerations. Stills. What type of steel are you using? What type of gas should be used with that? What amperage should it be set at? What type of wire? Wire size. What's the transfer mode? Is it short? Is it a spray? And then should it be a pulse or double pulse? And then of course the welding equipment. We've got equipment out there that's preferred by many manufacturers. Uh, this one is a multi-MIG 511. We have a 522. Each of these, depending on the type, will either have a single gun or a double gun. They can use a regular standard torch or a push-pull torch. But with this, you need to look at what type of gas should you be using. Is it pure argon, depending on the type of material you're welding? Is it 7525? The liner, what type of liner? Depending on the type of material you're using, is it steel? Is it aluminum? And the amperage? Wire? What type of roller? Depending on the wire, depends on the type of roller you're using for the machine. And the thickness? Looking at the equipment, When we look at the material, we want to find out how thick the material is that you're welding so that we know how to set the machine up depending on the type of material or the thickness of the material. depends on what our setting is, which is, help going, to, is going to control the amperage and the speed of the wire. Weld arcs. What type of weld arc am I looking for? Am I Am I, do I have a short weld arc? Do I have a long weld arc? Uh, how fast am I going to weld? How slow am I going to weld? That's a lot of the technician themselves on how they like to weld. Some people like to weld very close, very fast. Some are a little bit further away so they can see the material. Shielding gas. Again, what type of gas are you going to use for the material and the type of welding that you're doing? One of the things, a good rule of thumb is when you're measuring how fast the gas should be set at, a lot of times you're looking at the wire diameter. So if you're welding a one millimeter wire, you're going to multiply that by 10 and you're looking at 10 liters per second or per minute of shielding gas in order to weld that. And depending on the gas, one thing you need to be careful of with MIG welding is if you're using a shielding gas, you need to be careful of winds, uh, air currents, anything like that that's going to uh, change your shielding gas in any way. Gun liner. What are you going to put inside the gun liner? If you're using uh, stainless steel, 
steel, flux core, anything like that, you're going to use one type of liner. If you're using aluminum, you're probably going to use either a Teflon or a carbon fiber liner. We don't want to use the same liner that we use for aluminum with steel because you have the cross-contamination with that. Look at the wire, si wire size. That will also help determine the type of liner that you're going to be using. Uh, some liners will be set for a 0.6 millimeter to a 0.9 millimeter, and the next liner will be set up for a 0.8 to a 1.2 millimeter wire. With the wire, you also need to look at the different pressure needed at the roller surface. If you're using steel, silicon braze, you may be setting the wire pressure or the wheel pressure up to anywhere between one to three. If you're using aluminum because it's a more pliable material, one may be the max for the roller pressure because we don't want to crush and spread the wire out. Types of rollers. This will vary with the wire that you're using. Uh, you'll see in the top left there's a V-groove. That's for a harder wire such as a steel, uh, stainless steel, maybe uh, copper. Then you get into the U-groove. That's going to be designated towards an aluminum wire because it's a softer wire. We don't want to damage it. And then the gnarled wheel is basically it's for a cord, uh, cord wires which are easily deformed. So we, we don't want to damage those at all. So we're going to use a gnarling wheel for that type of wire. Types of guns. You have a push-pull gun and a regular uh, push gun. With the push-pull, we normally use those with smaller or softer diameter uh, wires, uh, such as aluminum. The advantage with the push-pull is, one, you have adjustable speed at the torch handle. You also have the ability to reduce any slack in the wire running through the torch because you have rollers right at the torch handle that will reduce the amount of flex or burn back from the wire, which gives you a more consistent weld, especially with aluminum or a pliable material. The electrodes, most commonly used, 6 millimeter, 8 millimeter, 9 millimeter, those are what's primarily used out in the shops today. You're going to see some, especially with the new vehicles coming out, the 1.2 millimeter, 1 millimeter. But it's important to match the contact tip with the wire size. And it's also important to match what type of wire it is. If it's aluminum, you only want to use a tip just for aluminum. If it's steel, you want to use steel tips, or the tips for the steel. Wires, AWS, ER, 70S, 6. Basically, the AWS is melting, uh, American Welding Society standard. Uh, that's the electrode, then the uh, rod that you're going to use. Uh, the 70S is your tensile strength, 70,000 PSI. Uh, it's a solid wire. And that's your chemical makeup. On that wire, you're also going to see with our programs, you're going to determine what wire it is. Is it a 5356 aluminum mag, uh, aluminum mag or is it aluminum silicone 4047? What's the diameter of the wire? Is it a 0 0.6, 0 0.9, 1.2, 1.0 uh, millimeter wire? And then you're going to see what type of gas should be used with that. With these, you're also going to have a program number. So as we tune in the program onto the system, we just dial in whatever program is recommended for that type of wire, that diameter, and then choose that as for the program, which should set all the parameters for the best welding for that type of wire. MIG welding variables. Gun speed. How fast are you moving the gun? 
Gun distance. How close are you to the material? What angle do you have the gun at? Do you have it tilted too much? Is it to the right, to the left? The wire, gun direction, and panel fit up. These are some of the variables. When you look at the weld starting at the top, you have a nice, very nice weld. If you have a very thin weld, chances are you're probably traveling too fast. If your weld starts to really spread out and gets too big, you're probably traveling too slow. If you have sporadic weld or thin, thick, your voltage is too low as it's changing. If you got a very hot uh, heat effect zone, voltage is too high. That's where you can possibly burn through. And then you can see some of the other types of welds. Voltage, current, resistance. These are some variables. When we talk about voltage, we're talking about the welder pressure that keeps the current flowing. Current is the arc between the wire and the metal. Resistance, the distance between the tip of the wire and the metal. Voltage and shielding gas affect how the wire melts off. If the voltage is too low, the wire might not melt before hitting the metal, which pushes the gun away from the work. If the voltage is too hot, it's going to melt, burn back to the tip. That's when you're going to damage a lot of your tips. Suggestions for welding 18 gauge galvanized weld 2.0.023 or 0.030 or wire voltage setting. Basically it's 14 to 16. A couple tips with this. More voltage means more heat. Less voltage, less heat. Other guidelines, you need to listen. You need to be able to hear what you're welding. Listen for the crackling or the smooth weld. If the arc is hissing uh, wide and flat, turn down the voltage. If the wire is pushing against the work, pushing the gun back, you got a narrow round bead, increase your voltage. So you always got to be able to see what you're welding listen to how you're welding and be able to adjust with your hand speed the location of the torch or you may have to just adjust the machine itself welding amperage is controlled by the wire feed setting setting the wire feed automatically sets the amperage so when we look at the thickness of the metal We'll dial in the thickness if it's a 2.0 thick wire or a piece of material. We're going to set that setting, which is going to set our amperage, which controls the wire speed. Wire feed is determined by how much the wire comes out of the gun during a 10 second period. If you turn the wire speed up, you need a higher current. If, it, if you turn your wire speed down, lower current. With the synergic settings on a lot of these welders, what will happen is when you adjust one, the other parameters will automatically adjust accordingly. So you don't have to go in and adjust the wire speed, then the amperage. It will automatically do that. Things that could affect the uh, feed dirty gun liner or a guide, incorrect wire spool tension, maybe if you tighten it up too tight it's going to not allow the wire speed, corroded wires, uh, especially when you start getting into aluminum, you want to make sure that you have those covered when not used, uh, make sure there's no oxidation on those, wrong wire size contact tip, uh, worn or blocked contact tip such as the one that you see there, your equipment's only as good as how you keep it and treat your equipment. This is going to determine the type of welds that you're also going to have. Travel speed is fast. Gun's going to move along. 
the weld site, this will affect two things, weld penetration and your bead height, depending on how you move your gun at what speed. The direction you move the gun. If you push the gun into the material, you're going to increase your penetration, your depth of the weld. If you pull it, you're going to decrease your penetration. Gun angle affects where the heat's going to be directed. It may depend on the type of the joint that you're doing, whether it's a, a horizontal weld, vertical weld, overhead weld. If you're pushing or pulling, normally most companies will direct the uh, angle of the gun to be about a 10 to 15 degrees from your root of the weld. If it's a butt joint, uh, plug welds, things like that, uh, you're probably going to be perpendicular to your weld because you want all the heat focused in that area. Gun distance from the weld site, the stick out of the wire, that's the distance from the contact to the electrode. These may be adjusted on some machines. Stick out affects weld penetration. If it's too short, penetration will increase. Too long, you'll decrease. You'll start pushing away. Uh, what will happen is, in a lot of cases, that weld will start to cool before it hits a material. You won't form a pull, and it's going to push your gun away. Uh, but depending on the technician, some guys will weld with a short stick out or small arc because they weld very quickly. It's going to increase your heat. If you've got a long one, as far as the stick out of the wire, it's going to decrease the penetration, but technicians can slow down and watch what they're doing. Uh, when we look at a lot of the welders out there, again, this is a technician setup. They're going to determine how they want the welder set up. A lot of the conventional welders didn't have these type of settings, so it was left up to the technician on how he welded his skills. With the new machines, they can be set at different lengths depending on how the welder is, how the technician welds. So there's a lot more control with the new welders versus the older welders. Once you get the stick out set, it should remain constant while you're welding. Uh, you moving in, moving out is going to change. It's going to get too hot, too cool. Uh, if you get closer to the material, you, sh you should be speeding up your hand. If you're further away, you should be slowing down. Types of weld, weld positions, and weld defects. There's several different types of welds out there, like the butt joint, the T joint, or the lap joint, uh, fillet, any edge joints, um, gap joints with backing pads, things like this. Considerations when welding these joints, one, we need to take in consideration the torch access, technical requirements, clamping and the fit up of the materials, the different alloys that we're using. What's the OEM recommendations for this? Material and the thickness type. What joint are we using? Plug welds. This is where you're going to be basically holding the gun straight on top of the weld, focusing your heat into the weld, and you're going to fill the plug weld up. Depending on the type of material, the thickness, a lot of trucks, SUVs, if it's a full frame, a lot of those are about a six millimeter thick or a quarter inch thick material. 
If you're welding vertical, requires a lower wire feed so that you don't puddle. This is where you're going to see a lot of advantages with the pulse and double pulse welders, giving you that vertical and overhead welding where you're not going to see the puddling. Weld positions. Is it a flat piece of metal? You horizontal, you're vertical, or is it overhead? Different types of imperfections in the butt welds. If you look at the first one, that's probably the proper weld. The next one down shows what we refer to as undercutting, where the filler material is below the edge of the base material. If you've got it too high, you're going to see a weld bead that's much higher than your base material. Root reinforcement's too high. That's where you're going to see the back side, where the root of the weld is. You'll have it start to uh, come out the back side. Edge misalignment it could be the angle of the gun. It could be your, the technician themselves. It could be the material not lined up. Top bead depression. That's where you're going to have uh, your weld that's going to have a depression in it. Root side suck, suck back is where the back side is, has a depression in it where it's pulled back into the weld. And then the notches would be a larger weld where you're going to have multiple uh, pullbacks in those areas. Looks like notches. Porosity, splatter, cracks, undercut, burn through, edge. These are all different types of defects in the welds. Splatter, uh, when you have splatter, it could mean you've got too much stick out with the wire, worn contact tips, unbalanced settings, incorrect shielding gas, maybe you don't even have the gas turned on in some cases and you forget that. Cracks in the weld, improper cooling, contamination of the weld site, those are probably the most common reasons for having cracks in the weld. Having an edge on the weld, worn gun or wrong gun angle, uh, poor technique. Welding is a technique with a with a MIG welder. You have to practice. Not filling the joint. Maybe you were too fast with the welder, didn't get enough penetration. Maybe the wire wasn't set. The welder wasn't set properly. Burn through. Most time with burn through, it's either you're traveling too slow, heat settings too high, or you got the wrong gun angle. You're not if you're moving from right to left or left to right, you don't have the gun at the proper angle to force the heat out in front of the weld uh, or behind the weld. Poor penetration. Uh, it could be voltage in the shop. Uh, the welder should be set up on a different circuit as the rest of the equipment in the shop. Heat's too low, travel speed's too fast, wrong welding gun, stick out's too long. There's a lot of things that'll cause poor penetration in the weld. One of the materials that you're going to see more commonly out there in the next few years is aluminum and just not not just on your high-end vehicles either. These are going to be on the more common vehicles. You're seeing them today with hoods and a lot of outer panels, but you're going to see a lot more structural aluminum in the vehicles today. Aluminum has a melting temperature of about 600 degrees Celsius, while steel is probably right around 1500 degrees Celsius. The main thing with the wire for Aluminum is storage. You're not going to do as many welding projects or repairs than you are still at this time. So when you're not using the aluminum wire, you need to make sure you properly store it for the next time that you use the wire. If you've got any silicon beads that help dry the air out, put it in a, a vacuum seal, if you've got something that you can cover the wire up, keep it in a warm area so that you're not in a humid area. There's a lot of things that you can do with the wire 
but if you're not going to use it every day, you need to make sure you take care of the wire. In an order to form proper weld, the oxidized film needs to be removed or cracked in the welding process to allow for a fusion of the material. So preparation for the weld with aluminum is very critical. Your base material needs to be cleaned both front side and back side because as you weld you're going to draw material through the aluminum from the back side so you need to make sure that you have the oxidation off the back side of the material as well as the front if possible. You need to know the alloy that you're working with. What type of aluminum is it? What's the machine setting for that? What's the material thickness? So with aluminum alloys there's a lot of different types of alloys in relationship to the use. Aluminum alloys with magnesium 300 series. You have aluminum alloys with silicone 4000 4, series. Aluminum alloys with magnesium 5000 series. 6000 series. And you have some with zinc and magnesium that are 7000 series. Uh, the majority of the F-150 is 6000 series so you need to understand what type of material you're working with so that you know what type of wire to use for that. There's four essentials for aluminum welding. The gas. What type of gas are you going to use for that type of welding? With aluminum and MIG brazing, normally it's 100% argon. There's 75-25 you're normally using with steel. The materials, what materials are you using? What alloy? What's the diameter? What tip do you need? What roller do you need? What type of liner do I need? Those are all things that you need to understand. But just as important as that is, one, you need the training. You need to know how to weld the different types of materials. You need to know what the OEM repair procedures are for that type of material. And people can have all kinds of training and awards, but you've got to have the ability to perform the proper welds. If you've taken a break going on vacation, I recommend you get back and practice your skills again before stepping in right into a repair project. Because a lot of people, if you've welded aluminum and you take a break, you need to get back in there and start welding aluminum again before you start your repair projects. Brazing. That's a process of joining materials. Uh, you're not melting the materials, you're fusing them together. So uh, the brass is more of a filler material that's going to create a metallic joint between the two parts and hold it together. The silicone copper used as a filler material adheres to the surfaces creating a joint between the sheets. So you can see with the picture on the right that you have as much silicone bronze on top as you do on the bottom spreading out. So what's going to happen is where there's a gap you're going to have that silicone melt through and create a fusion on the back side as almost as large as what you have on the top side. So it creates a nice bond between the two pieces of metal. Same thing with a, a lap joint is you're going to create a filler material that bonds to the, the two, two, me two metals together and doesn't actually fuse them together. You're going to see this method used on a lot of newer vehicles with ultra high strength steel, advanced high strength steels. So when you're dealing with some of these dual phase boron martensetic steels throughout these vehicles, you're going to see repair methods calling for more MIG brazing. 
the diagram that you see here is on one of the newer Hondas. You've got a door ring that's boron that is a complete replacement of that door ring. There's no sectioning to it. If you cannot use a squeeze type resistance welder to make the weld, they recommend you use a plug weld with MIG braze. Some of the other manufacturers will also call for the same repair method. It has a much lower heat effect zone. What you're doing is basically melting the brass and allowing it to join the metal. So you're not actually heating the metal up to the same temperature you are the brass and it's definitely lower than what the melting point is on the steel. So with these different types of metals, you're going to create a very, very low heat effect zone, which is not going to damage the base material. Here you'll see different areas, especially in the center section where you're using 1500 megapascal steel. And the method for joining those is going to be MIG brazing in a lot of different areas. They'll use a slotted, uh, slotted hole. Uh, sometimes they'll use two plug holes next to each other that you're going to weld and fill. But you'll see more and more aluminum and MIG brazing with the upcoming vehicles that are coming out on the market today. So one thing that you need to be ready for and make sure that you have the right equipment is for these types of materials that are coming out. And I would like to thank you for joining us today. And if there's any questions, uh, feel free to, uh, you'll have my email information and you also will be collecting the questions at the end of this that I'll respond to. And that's it. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, again, if you have any questions, please post them either to the Twitter feed or uh, to the comments section at the bottom of your screen. Thanks for joining us and have a great day.